I, see, I was gonna say the video just went away. <laughs> because it's, oh yeah, it's letting us see you recording. Okay. Awesome. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Chasing Dreams podcast. Um, I'm so excited to have our host. I, I, I'm sure I say that every week, but I'm really excited to have our host, our guest host today, uh, Mr. Reggie Howard. And today we will be talking about balancing mental health while chasing the dream. So he is the podcast host of Black Mental Health Podcast. If you're not subscribe make sure you subscribe it's really good information really good content he's also a mental clarity coach and the author of suffering into success and you can find him at reginald a howard on instagram hey reggie how are you how are you thank you for having me of course of course I think part of the reason I'm so excited about every guest that we've had so far is because season one, like, I'm just tapping into my dope-ass network. Mm -hmm. Like, I know too many phenomenal people to be reaching out to strangers. Like, (laughs) I know so many, and even with season one, like, I already have people that I'm like, ooh, I wish I could, you know? So, like, there's, I just know too many phenomenal people doing amazing things, and I cannot wait to highlight, so... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm I'm excited because I know you you're a good person to pull out information and um certain interviews that I do I know you're going to get a different aspect no, nobody has ever got because you're a good conversationalist. So I'm excited to see what we talk about today. <laughs> <laughs> talk about pressure. <laughs> Hold on, let me read. Let me look at my questions again. Hold on. <laughs> Ooh, that's a lot of weight. Um, I will do my best, y'all, to get this information out, okay? No <laughs> pressure. <laughs> so, I start every interview by asking this very simple question. What is the dream? For me, as far as in a general or just for me? In, 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 for, for you. Me, for me, the dream is uh, generational wealth. Mm. Um, we come from, uh, especially coming from like the urban community, it's it's not a lot of uh, legacy step uh, set up for us. We have stories, we have different. Um, honestly, it's a lot of trauma that's passed down to us more than financial wealth, uh, educational wealth, uh, just emotional wealth. It's it's more of just a lot of trauma. So for me, it's just trying to pass down intergeneration intergenerational wealth in all areas, and my grandkids, kids. Can benefit the work that I do today. So just trying to make, change the paradigm of the trajectory of my family circle because I'm tired of the deadbeat dads. I'm tired of the broken families. I'm tired of uh, no money, got to stretch. So it's like, all right, who's going to change this? I can't wait. Nobody's coming to change it and save you. So who's going to change it? So for me, the dream is, thank God my great-great-grandfather did this because if he didn't do this, I'd probably be over here with this. Fact, fact. <laughs> that I, I relate to that dream so much. So when I think about like my why and what pushes me, it's my baby sister mm. and wanting to show her the best example of Black girl magic that I could possibly show her. We're 10 years apart. And so everything, like as far back as I can remember, like I went to Virginia Tech. She was like, I'm going to go to Virginia Tech. My, little sister, my big sister goes to Virginia Tech. That's where I want to go, you know? Um, I pledge my sorority, and she's, like, playing with my games and, all, you know, all this other stuff. And, right. like, being conscious of the fact that she's coming into her own now because she's 18. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'll give her her credit where credit is due. Right. But just being conscious of the fact that there's someone watching, mm-hmm. right? Then I also have my eight nieces and nephews. Mm-hmm. So when I think about who I want to be in their life, I want to be able to say... As your graduation gift, I'm either going to pay for your school tuition or I'm going to, like, pay for you to or invest to start your business. Mm -hmm. You're going to do one or the other. You're going to either start a business or go to school. Right. But let me help with the financial investment in that. Um, And then also, you know, for me, it's for my twins, like, living in their honor and building that legacy through people who didn't even get to grace the earth, you know? Um, But definitely when I think about the dream, the why behind my dream is definitely rooted in the next generation. I always say if I was, if my dream was solely based off of me, I'd have gave up a long time ago. Exactly. (laughs) Oh, that's real. That's real. And that's why you have to have that why. 
because there are plenty of times I don't feel like doing this shit. I don't feel like it. I really don't feel like it. Right. But I think about those silent promises Mm -hmm. that the beneficiary haven't even heard, Mm -hmm. but it's in my heart for them. And you don't even realize that, and that was something we talked about a little bit off air, but you don't even realize how many other dreams are connected to yours. And in a sense, you're saying you're doing it, but people are watching you. So if you fell, you let 20, 30, 40 other people down and not saying it as a pressure thing. It's like, no, that's how um, inspiring you are, like that you have to keep going because it's so many babies, so many lives, so many people that's like, damn, like they just lose hope now. And I don't want nobody to lose hope off the fact that I don't have the hope anymore. It's like, all right, I got to be able to muster up something in me to figure it out. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to muster it up to get it because it's too many people attached to what I'm, I got going on. Definitely. <laughs> when did you realize the dream and how has it changed over the years? All right. So, uh, and perfect question. Um, my dream. Well, I live into my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, Thank you. <laughs> it, you. Your dream changes over time. Um, and so first it was my mom was a single mom. My dad really wasn't there. Um, and she, I'm a first generation American. So my mom came to America since she was 16. And all she know is work. She just work, 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 work. And I'm like, man, I want to hope one day to help my mom out because she's just so much working. I, now I'm going up into my 20s. I have my first son. And now I have basically a family before because it could have been just me and my son on some pursuit of happiness and trying to figure it out like that. But now I have a, a woman depending on me and now I have a child depending on me. And that is a whole different ballpark, too. So now it's like, all right, I still got my mom, but now I got this mile, these two miles to feed as well. And I want to be the best father that I I really have. Like, yeah, it it shifted again. Now, even more recently, um, I I have my second son. And now I legit have a family. It's no, like, all right, baby mama, like, all of that stuff, that goes out. Now I, like, legit have, like, a, a unit that looks at me and be like, all right, what you going to do? Like, we got to eat, and we looking at you to make something happen. And to to that to your point, I actually looked at recently this year my dreams that I wrote down when I was 21 when I had my first son, totally different things. And, and, and the, it was more materialistic back then because that's how much stuff I wanted. It was like I wanted a bowling alley in my house. I want two basketball courts, one indoor, one outdoor, two swimming pools, one indoor, one outdoor. I'm like, you don't even need all of that. Like, how do you, how if you got all that stuff in your house, when do you ever leave? And right. it's like now my dream is I want my kids to go to the best school. Now I want a dream what and now I want, you know, it changed and as I grew over time. So people will have this one vision and think is that it'll it you don't know what you don't know until you get there. And it's like, oh wow, like all right, now it's it's grown into something else. I'm still I still want a lot of the things that I did want back in the day. But now as I grow, it's like and mature, it's like, all right, that don't matter as much to me as making sure my son is in a in a good system and um, making sure he has a business that he can call his own, setting it up. Like, so it changes over time, um, but just don't lose yourself within it and you'll yeah. feel like you're growing with it. Yeah, that's why I not necessarily oppose, but I'm not a fan of like, Oh, where do you see yourself in five years? I'm done with that. Hell, I don't know, okay? It's impossible. Like, I don't know. And I remember when I sat down, 2016, I sat down and mapped out what I wanted for my business, because that's when I started the business. I was like, oh, you know, where do I see my business going in in five years? I did all that in a year, in 2017. So it... Since 2017, I no longer even focus on the whole, like, where do you see yourself in five years? Because sometimes we put things in that five-year plan that if you just took action every single day, you could see, like, you could get there. You could get there. You know what I mean? Um, And so that's why, like, when I set goals, I'm like, like, right now, I'm working on my, I call it my 2019 and a half goals. I'm looking at them right now. (laughs) So literally when I got settled, so after the conference in September, mm-hmm. then October, the beginning of October, or towards the end of September, I said, you know, let me sit down, 
let me plan out my what I want to accomplish before the year ends. Not, oh, New Year's resolution, <laughs> you know, all of that stuff. No, what can I do now to right. accomplish in the next couple of months? Right. Really just thinking about, like, what am I focused on now? Now, I do have a five-year, like, grand vision for what could be, but my focus is on what am I doing now? Right. Like, it, what's happening now? It, it, it's almost in the perfect uh, position that I, or the perfect picture that I, I, I can describe it to anybody that's trying to figure out what we mean when we're saying that. It's almost like, I know I want to get to California. I'm in Philly right now. I know I want to get to California. In this map along the way, you don't know what uh, road blockages, what traffic, what detours, what thing. As long as you can get to California, that's all you need to know. But trying to find out those, all right, I want to have a pit stop right here. You would never be able to know what you're going to run into along the way. You're going to have to get redirected multiple times. At a certain point, you just got to go. You just got to, that's it. Just drive. And when you, you just know where you're going. Where you you're going never be. be ready. Ever. Ever. Yep. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah. So how does mental health impact us as content creators, entrepreneurs, business owners, and what tools can we use to find that balance? Well, see, that's the thing. And I've, I've learned this over time, especially with mental health. We try to run away from our pain instead of embracing it. And I know when we talked off air, you talked about your twin, you talked about the stuff that you went through. But it's almost like one of your greatest gifts, and not because of the loss, but because of the lessons and the ambition you gained from it. So, um, for example, I didn't want to be homeless at one point, but I'm so happy that it happened because now it, it, it teaches me a lesson of, you know, this being more, you need to be grateful for the little stuff and to be in pursuit because it can go worse at any time. So you can leave a memory in your children's name. You can leave a legacy. You can do this. It. We embrace our pain to create the content. Now you have stuff to talk about. Before, people just want to talk and do stuff but don't have any emotion behind it. It's almost like uh, the kids that imitate like what they see in the hood but not going through the hood experience. It's like we did this. We do. We act like this because of what we've been through. They always say, oh, rap music is bad and stuff. Like We're rapping about what we've been through. Yeah. I mean, yeah, <laughs> that's it. If you ch if you want to change the mu music, music change the environment. So I think our uh, as far as when it relates to mental health, it's our struggles, the trauma, the the depression, the the anxiety, the suicide. That is your your content. You are your content. Mm -hmm. What you've been through, everything that you've gone through, can help somebody else. So it that I hope that answered the first part, and I think the second yeah. part. Was um that That's I want to add to it. the fine balance. Finding balance. I, I meditate, uh, reading, um, and and journaling. I use those three things because, like I said, reading helps fills me up. It teaches me new things, give me new perspective. Journaling helps me pour out. It helps me get things out that I would never probably say to anybody else or that I don't feel comfortable. Um, and then meditating. Meditating helped me reflect on just life in general. Just sitting back and. And just trying to figure out what's going on. Life moving so fast. Sometimes it's literally stopping and smelling the roses and trying to understand what's happening to me. So those three things help with the, the managing of the balancing and just using the content that, I, that I'm creating in my life journey that it, 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 it'll help like dictate everything else around it. For sure. For sure. I'm definitely a big component of uh, journaling. For yeah. sure. Uh, I don't. I hope no one ever reads my journal, like, just put my journals in the grave with me. Right. <laughs> it's better for everybody. Just throw it on in there with me. Um, but not only that, for me, it includes, self, like, having a self-care routine, mm -hmm. making sure that I start my day focused on myself, mm -hmm. um, having at least one day of rest in between, and then also uh, therapy. So I'm in therapy every week, even though I'm not dealing with any major crisis. It's helping me deal with my baggage. Mm -hmm. And when a crisis does come up, like, for example, this past week, things, you know, the grief kind of was overwhelming. So that's what we talked about. You can handle it. And the reason I, I advocate for therapy, one, a few things that I believe in for therapy. One, finding a therapist that matches your racial and gender identity. Mm -hmm. 
and then having it in place so that when shit hits the fan, mm -hmm. you don't have to do those intake conversations. Mm -hmm. She already knows you. She are, well, for me, she, but, you know, like, she already knows my problems. She already knows my history. We've already had in-depth conversations. I can't imagine experiencing the grief like flare 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 up i don't know what i'm trying to say come back up flare up <laughs> flare up <laughs> come back up um or even when i lost the twins i didn't know i was about to ha go through a miscarriage of two children right but because i was already seeing a therapist at that time mm -hmm. we had already gone through you know who's your insurance company et cetera, et cetera. and when shit hit the fan we could just talk about that. Right. We could be focused and intentional on getting through that. And even with my most recent grief fail experience, <laughs> um, being able to just, like, she already knew who I am. Mm. And being able to just say, like, this week, I'm really not okay. Right. And and that being okay. The the component of therapy, because I, I, it, I try to play both ends of the spectrum. As much as we preach about it, a lot of people just not going to go. So That's I try right. to get them in the, the comfort zone. Therapy is next. Before you have to, what they say with everything, you got to accept and acknowledge that you have something going on with you. Now, some people are accepting the knowledge and then they'll go drinking or whatever the case may be. Some people is like, all right, we got to get you some tools that you can start with. I always recommend you have to, like you said, it, it got to be a, a conversation like already be having it. But people will see like, why do I need therapy? Have you read your journal? <laughs> like, have you? <laughs> That's real. That's real. <laughs> Do you hear you? Do you hear you? Would you when you read it back? Does that sound like somebody I that don't know I'm talking? <laughs> no, like that ain't that ain't normal, Stacey. Right. <laughs> Makes sense. So, how can we better support the mental health of Black men in America? The 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 political answer is um making uh creating safe spaces and um making it comfortable um and trying to do that but to be honest i feel like black women have been doing a great job of that already and i think where the problem lies in is that they're not equipped with the the tools and the research and all that stuff behind the scenes that can actually make the man grow you can't make the man do anything but that will help him grow but women want to be there emotionally to support. It's like, I don't know what to do, but I'm a, I can try a bunch of things to help you. And it's like, he needs some real help, some real genuine sit down help. And again, what we just talked about earlier, he has to admit that to himself first. And I think importantly, what I'm doing, not to like toot my own horn or anything like that, is I just want to draw awareness first. Like, let me tell y'all what it looked like. So that way, now I'm not coming as a therapist. I'm not coming as anything else, but... A big, a big, I almost heard, a big ass billboard that say, "Look, we effed up out here." <laughs> like, yeah. that's that's all I am being a big billboard for it. And it's like I, I speak your language. I know exactly what you're going through, and I talk to y'all behind the scenes. And like you said with the journaling, some things you they don't want to say out loud. It's like, all right, if I say I like her, but I just like cheating on her, that sounds bad when I, I mention it to her. And nobody's going to feel comfortable, especially if you're coming into a woman therapist or something like that. It's like, she's a woman first, so she ain't trying to hear that. Like, wait, you just like cheating on her. So you got to save space, but then you also have to, it's just a bunch of things around it. I would say is just bringing the awareness around it is the first step for anything because most men don't think they got a problem. They most, I, I felt the same way. It was when I seen uh, depression, anxiety, mental health, all that stuff. I'm like, wait, that's white women soccer moms that stay at home moms i don't have nothing wrong with me and then it's like oh snap my dad not being there is a problem oh snap like like i just have all of these things that's bottled up anger because i can't find a job because of they they looking at me where oh man i gotta cut my hair off because they don't they don't hire people with dreads or just all of these things as men that we don't know is emotionally uh to taking a toll on us and we just sit there and just like no, nah, I'm cool. Like, no, nah, I'm good. Or I'm going to smoke this away or I'm going to drink this away. Like, I'm straight. And you got to first admit and look and be like, all right, I'm not straight. Or, oh, man, like, he know what I feel. Like, so I think that's a lot of it, just more awareness. And then once you get them aware, then that's when the work can really start. 
For sure, for sure. And one thing that you mentioned that I definitely wanted to highlight, you mentioned like kind of how as a man, you kind of assume, let me say it this way. I like to bring awareness to the fact that daddy issues are not a female thing. At all. There are plenty of men who have daddy issues who don't even know it. So I'm, I, I just wanted to highlight that piece of what you said, because it's a real thing. Like, you feeling like, if I ever see my father on the streets, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. Yep. That's a problem. Like, you shouldn't have that anger and that hurt built up and thinking that that's okay. Just because daddy issues look different for women, don't mean you ain't dealing with it, that you not that you don't have them. I, I look at my son, my first son, especially my oldest. He was my biggest change, and I'm his superhero. Mm-hmm. And if I let him down, it really hurts him. And now that resentment breeds and stuff like that. So now when I look at men, all it was was a superhero. Never, he let them down. Like, he didn't give them... It's like um, giving them that confidence of being a man. I never, you, didn't, you didn't have no one build you up. You were still... Honestly, that what you just said, where it's like, yo, if I see him on the street, that's that little boy talking. That's right. the baby boy that got hurt. It's like, yo, no, you ain't bring my bike, or no, you ain't do this. Like, so when I see you, I'm gonna get you. And now I'm old enough to actually do it. As a kid, I couldn't do nothing, but now I'm old enough to actually catch you. And when I catch you, I'm gonna make sure you feel the pain that I felt. And I've literally heard that from a couple of guys. One of them too. And, and they would say it as if that's supposed to be normal. And I'm like yo, you got to deal with that. Like, like, I, and I'm saying this as someone, I know I have daddy issues. You know what I mean? So I'm not saying that as if, like, I'm above it. I have my daddy issues, and they have absolutely shown up in some of the typical ways that it shows up in females, but highlighting the fact that daddy issues show up in men too, it just don't look like the same way it may look for a female to express those. When I, I I'll, I'll leave off with this. I always tell people there's, um, it's a quote that I came up with. We all had daddyless days and motherless moments. And it was, it was times in our lives where you wanted your dad to show up and he wasn't there. Or your mom to show up and she wasn't there. And now that moment has affected you for the rest of your life. And you complete carpentalize. I can't even say that word. <laughs> that moment. And now it's affecting you long term over time. So daddyless days, motherless moments. It'll affect you if you don't actually get into why it's affecting you long term. Yeah. And I think for me, the moment uh, the moment I was able to move past some of my daddy issues was the moment that I realized this man, don't, he, he just don't know no better. Like, he really doesn't know different. And so when I stopped expecting him to show up how I wanted him to show up, and started realizing that this he doing the best he can. Like at this point, it is what it is. I think this was uh, this was after I had lost the twins, and mm-hmm. I was like, I just I had no more fight. Like mm-hmm. I couldn't fight about nothing else. Mm-hmm. I don't need argue no more. Like mm-hmm. I literally will not argue <laughs> with anybody. And it the part of the reason being is I feel like stress was the reason I lost the twins mm-hmm. because of the fighting and the arguing. So now I won't even argue. If you start to argue. <laughs> I, like the conversation's over like that's it so around that time I was like I can't even fight about daddy issues I'm tired like he show up when he show up he don't when he don't he call when he feel like it he'll text me whenever he thinks about it. you know what I mean it's just right. like whatever it is is what it is and from that place of releasing the expectations now we're in a pretty good spot I, I always say you either fighting for your childhood or the relationship. And you're not a child anymore, so you can't fight for that but so long. But you can still fight for the relationship and to the point where you don't even have to fight for it. You just meet them where they're at. You, like you just said, that key thing is we got to lower that expectation. They're not Superman. They're a they're human. human. Yes. <laughs> That's it. They're not superhuman. That's a, it. A flawed human. That's it. Understanding that hurt people hurt people. Yeah. I had to see his daddy issues yep. and understand, like, he don't even know what this looks like. At all. Based on his relationship with his father, because his superhero didn't show up. I'm showing my dad. I just Before we got on, on here to do this interview, I was on the phone with my dad. I'm telling him how to be a man. 
and I hope he never hears this because I know how offensive it can sound because we just in a good space. I'm I call him Junior. Like he's Junior. I'm uh, like I'm Reggie. But I'm his Junior. But no, you're my Junior because I'm teaching you everything you couldn't give to me. And I'll end, again, I said I'm gonna end it before. I'll end it with this. Where it's, it's messing me up now, he's disappointed when I don't call him. He's this my dad that's supposed to teach me. And how you think I felt when you didn't call and pick me and pick and then had me waiting and stuff? Now he's just hey, I ain't hearing from you in a long <laughs> Nigga, I'm the child. <laughs> what? So now I'm telling him how to do this and showing him how to do it, but that's okay because I understand, like you just said. He didn't have the blueprint. I'm creating the blueprint. Now I'm giving it back. Here you go, Pop. Now, now we just on some man to man relatable level as opposed to like, all right, Dad, can you come save me? Can you do? It? I don't need. I just want to have a relationship. That's it. That's all I want to have with you. That's fair. So my next question was, what is your mental health routine? I know you said journaling, reading, and meditation, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to also ask and see if there was something else that was a part of your mental health routine that kind of keeps you steady. I, I would, I just read this. I don't know if you've seen it on social media with Kevin Hart and when he went his car accident, mm -hmm. um, he's been in the car accident and then he just came back on social media where it was like, it put his life in perspective. And um, it's because he was just so work, 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 work. And you you realize it could be over like that. And the reason why I bring that up is because I recently went through a car accident in December. And um, we talked about it. I don't even know if it was off or on air. But in, oh, it was on air. 2018 was one of the best years of my life. And my book came out. I started speaking. My podcast came out, like a lot of things was happening. And then on December 27th, I got into an accident. Somebody ran a red light and ran into me. Now my leg is hanging over, my hand is messed up, all of this stuff. Um, and I'm like, God, why would this happen now in the midst of this? Um, in the midst of this struggle, in the midst of this, I, I was right there about to get to a certain place. And I'm actually kind of happy it happened because. The reason why so much things was going in persp perspiring, per no, that's sweating, Pro perspiring, <laughs> it was prospering. That's the word, prospering. <laughs> the reason why things were prospering was um, I had cut everybody off, mom, sister, even relationship. I, as much as I was preaching, it was like, you know what? I got to get it. Like, I have to get where I want to be. And I had cut so many people off, didn't care, didn't care about nobody feelings. It was like, oh, I'm off for self now. And now, at that point, I was totally dependent on everybody. I couldn't put my socks on. My mom had to feed me applesauce. Like, my girl had to come bathe me. Like, all of this stuff. And I say all that to say, my self-care routine now is to make sure I'm enjoying moments with my family, having them conversations with my mother, having them phone calls with my sister, even shoot before we get on this interview, talking to my dad, having those relationships being more intent with the moment, smelling the roses, because you can work, 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 but it don't mean nothing if you die. And so I have that routine for myself, but I also have that routine of making sure um, when my son is showing me something on his tablet, let me pay attention and not like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll get to it later. Or when my baby son wants to be picked up, um, I'm with him. Or when my girl wants to watch a movie, I'm watching it with her because you get so focused on the goal that you forget the, the, the moments in between and it's like, all right, I'm going to come back and enjoy those moments. What if you never get a chance to? And the fact that I almost could have been taken like that, and I didn't really get to, I spent a year of not enjoying moments with people. It was like, you know what? That's going to be included within my routine, making sure I'm making time for family, for friends, and just, yo, you good? Like, yo, you straight? Even when we first started talking, that was apart from me being in that accident. Like, let me make sure I'm being self-serving to others as well, because you don't know what can happen and just being make I'll be mad at myself if I didn't that I remember being in that ambulance and like God if I can get through this I swear I'm going to be way more of a servant because I can't believe this shit happened to me so now I'm being more of a self-servant as far as like or not self but giving to people and just trying to enjoy moments and be embraced with these uh, moments I hope that answered the question yeah for sure <laughs> I, I think to, to summarize what you're saying, and correct me if this is not, uh, but basically just being more present. Right. Yep. 
for sure. So what is your number one secret to success? Like if there was one thing that has led to some of your successes, what would it be? Reading. Reading mm-hmm. and research. And I watch a ton of interviews. I, wa- I read a ton of books. It's just acquiring knowledge, like a bunch of knowledge. Because while, and going back to my accident, while I'm in the therapy bed is when I come up with mental clarity coaching because I'm reading coaching books. I'm reading that. It's like, I can, again, talking about what we talked about earlier, using this trauma of what I'm going through to try to help somebody. So I was able to develop a lot of things just researching and reading. That has been my number. And when I go to schools and talk to uh, students, they ask me, well, what is this something that you wish you would have knew at this age um, that you know now that you wish you would have knew at our age as students? And I'm like, they tell us the stuff all the time. Read. Um, but we don't really <laughs> listen for it. Exactly. We're not listening. It's like they're saying reading is fundamental. Read. like They always preach the tools, but we never listen. But I always, it's just reading. Reading is my number one thing. And not reading just to read. And I put that in my book. Reading for understanding, reading to acquire knowledge, like literally not just saying I read 20, 30 books this year. Did you understand? Did you apply principles? Did you try these concepts? That has been my biggest uh, fortune within myself is like because being from the community, we don't have as much access to information. It was a reason why it was illegal to read during slavery time. Like <laughs> we don't have access to information. And the fact that we have an Internet where it's free to learn as much as you want. You have YouTube and Google, and we're not still not doing it. It's like, man, we just keeping ourselves down at this point because the information is out there. Exactly. For <laughs> sure. So what final thoughts do you have for us as an audience? All right. So this is the Chasing Your Dreams. I, I feel like uh, I think it's time to stop chasing and start catching. Like, we, 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 we spend a lot of time. And the one thing I love about you is your executor and a lot of people spend that time playing double dutch you know how when you about to jump in and it's like all right i'm i'm almost gonna do it what's the perfect timing <laughs> and it's like it's never going to be the perfect timing and you told me back way back when that i'm i'm gonna start a podcast and it's gonna come out soon and look what we talking about right now and a, a lot of people they just so infatuated with the chase of yeah i'm gonna start a podcast one day and never start the podcast. Once I get the perfect mic, once I get the perfect computer, once I get the perfect software, the lighting, all of this stuff. And it's almost like we never get the chance to actually catch the goal that we're chasing. And so more so, I hope people catch their goals instead of chasing them and really actually obtain the things that they want. Because we are I don't think we're supposed to die and then we go to a place of heaven and then, then we leave peacefully. I think it's supposed to be both parts. We live good here on earth and good is after we we pass on to the next generation. I mean, the next uh, whatever there is in life. And I think that is a part of executing. Just go up there and execute, re-execute, re-execute. And I know you have failures. I've had failures. But the only way you can catch that dream is to fail and go through the things and go through the trauma. So I would just say people focus on executing, catching the goals and catching the dream. Absolutely. You know, I stand for that one wholeheartedly. <laughs> I am very much a action oriented kind of person. Mm-hmm. Like you can tell me your dream all day long. God bless America. <laughs> but if you're not taking action, like it's for naught, honestly. Mm-hmm. And you do have some people who are very, like, they overthink some things. Mm-hmm. And there are certain things that you're not even going to learn until you just do it. do it. Yep. Like, we talked about that earlier. Like, what I learned, even with doing this podcast, I'm like, oh, shit. But I would have never known that until I did it mm-hmm. and learned from what I was doing. That's it. Like, you can't plan for everything. You just got... <laughs> There's a quote that says entrepreneurship is like jumping out of a plane and building the parachute on your way down. That's what this shit is. Like mm-hmm. sometimes you just gotta jump and figure that shit out. Mama. Mm-hmm. Like I, I got the uh, opposite end of it. Uh you fix the plane while flying it. <laughs> okay. okay. I mean, but the, the reality is you go. That's it. And you figure it out. That's it. Why are you on your way? For sure. So where can everyone find you? Um, I'm at Reginald A. Howard everywhere. Website, ReginaldAHoward.com. Email, ReginaldAHoward, Gmail. Everything is Reginald A. 
Howard. Um, and then if you type in Black Mental Health Podcast, I pop up too. Awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Just for sharing your time and your energy and your willingness to be a part of the podcast. I appreciate you. I hope people got some a tremendous amount of value. I'm always looking to provide value and I'm thank you for having me. I appreciate it. this is exciting. I like I'm I, I salute to you and all the work that you're doing. You're doing a great job, especially showing the way and paving the way for like just entrepreneurs in general. So salute to you and your vision and your goals and everything that you got going on. I appreciate that. Thank you. No problem.